Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to our annual Arthur B. and David B. Jacobson Lecture on Antisemitism. Our speaker, Professor Richard Brightman, is Distinguished Professor Emeritus in the Department of History at American University and is editor of the journal Holocaust and Genocide Studies. He received his AB from Yale University and his PhD from Harvard University. He's the author or co-author of 11 books and many articles on German history, American history, and the Holocaust. His books, The Architect of Genocide, Himmler and the Final Solution, published by Knopf in 1991, and Official Secrets, What the Nazis Planned, What the British and Americans Knew, published by Hill and Wang in 1998, were translated into five languages. He's co-editor of four volumes of the diary of James G. MacDonald, who was the first US ambassador to Israel. Volume four, Envoy to the Promised Land, will appear in early 2017. FDR and the Jews, co-authored with Alan Lichtman, won the 2013 National Jewish Book Award in American Jewish Studies and was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize in History. His lecture tonight, FDR and the Jews, is based on his research for the book of that name. Please join me in welcoming Professor Brightman to Brown. Thank you, Saul, for the generous introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation. How is the sound level back there? OK. Um, I last visited Brown uh, a few years ago, when I was 18. <laughs> uh, it would be hard for me to duplicate the excitement of that visit. Uh, I was playing in a tennis tournament. Uh, I can't do that anymore. Um, but if you'll help me, perhaps we can generate some intellectual sparks. It would probably help me for tonight and certainly help me for tomorrow uh, to know how many of you are students in Professor Teller's class. OK. Uh, good. I'll think about what to do tomorrow based on that uh, response. So um, I think I'm going to start by telling you how this book came about, because um, it may reveal something of our purpose and our methods. And uh, it, it might give you something to think about. Perhaps you can take away some. Uh, lessons from it. About, almost 30 years ago, I started work on a study of American refugee policy uh, with a colleague, Alan Kraut. Uh, we came to the conclusion that there hadn't really been a study of that subject in the Roosevelt years that used archival sources intensively. And we were based in Washington, DC, where the National Archives is. So we could spend months and months, it turned out to be years and years, a lot easier than people who were traveling for research. We, we looked at a range of government agencies and managed to open some collections that until then had been closed. But we also had to deal with the problem of Franklin Roosevelt. And so we each wrote a chapter about Roosevelt. 
mine was the later Roosevelt, Roosevelt and the Holocaust. At the end, I said to myself, this is pretty good, but I really didn't get to the bottom of a very complicated man. It was partly a question that I, a matter of the fact that I was still fairly young, not as young as when I came to Brown, but I was relatively young. And it was more a question of sources. Roosevelt is very difficult for historians. First of all, he was notorious for meeting with people, telling one visitor what he or she wanted to hear, and telling the next visitor with completely opposite convictions exactly the opposite. And so you have to apply a discount factor when you can find out what Roosevelt said. That's the next problem. Roosevelt did not keep a private diary except on very rare occasions. As president, did not write a lot of memoranda, did not write a lot of private letters. did not allow official cabinet minutes. Think about that. Different people who served on the cabinet, fortunately, kept diaries. They went back and wrote about it afterwards. But Roosevelt let other people generate records and wanted his advisors to believe that what they were telling him was confidential, that it wouldn't leak out, except, of course, when Roosevelt decided to leak something out. When there are young kids in the audience, I say, Roosevelt didn't tweet either. Um, so, I had public records of Franklin Roosevelt, and I had some diary accounts of what Roosevelt said on different occasions. But I didn't feel that I had very good sources, enough to really get at what was the true Franklin Roosevelt. I could see that Roosevelt was very different at different times, but I couldn't see why. So that book got published, and I went on to do other things, knowing that there was this nagging problem of Franklin Roosevelt. I won't talk about uh, many of the other things that intervened. Maybe that will be for class tomorrow. Uh, but. I gradually noticed that more and more sources were coming available. Some of it had to do with declassification of government records. Uh, a major change came in the mid-1990s when the family of Sumner Wells donated his papers to the Franklin D. Roosevelt Library and Memorial. Sumner Wells was a big name in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, not too many people of the younger generation know all that much about him. Uh, he was the number two man in the State Department. But beyond that, he was Roosevelt's man in the State Department who had known Franklin Roosevelt since he was a child. And the Secretary of State in the Roosevelt administration, a man named Cordell Hull, was not particularly close to Roosevelt, 
and was frequently in poor health. So uh, when Roosevelt wanted things done, he turned to Sumner Wells. Unlike Roosevelt, Sumner Wells kept pretty good records. So the Wells papers, I figured, were pretty important. And there was more than 100 boxes of Wells papers. Well, that was a big job, and I was doing other things. So I, it's not like I put down everything else and rushed off to Hyde Park. But I became aware that it might now be possible to do a lot more with Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, as Saul mentioned, I got involved uh, quite a while ago, uh, more than a decade ago, in editing the papers of James G. McDonald. McDonald kept diaries, very detailed diaries, part of the time. He started in the 1920s. He uh, was a major figure in really international refugee uh, policy early in the uh, Roosevelt administration. He became League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, kept a diary. And then after he resigned at the end of 1935, shortly after, he stopped keeping a diary, even though he became chairman of the Advisory Committee on Political Refugees for Franklin Roosevelt in 1938. McDonald didn't start, restart his diary until the end of 1945 when he was appointed to serve on the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry on Palestine. And then he became the first US ambassador to Israel and kept a diary. So I was brought in. The, the diaries and papers, some of the papers, were donated to the Holocaust Museum. And I was brought in to figure out a way to make all of this publishable. Well, there was this huge hole from mid-1936 through the war and the Holocaust. You couldn't publish a diary if a diary didn't exist. So along with some people, including one of McDonald's daughters, who was a Columbia PhD in history, we decided to synthesize a diary. What do I mean by that? Not to make it up, but to use primary sources, McDonald's letters, government records, other people's diaries mentioning McDonald, to make it read as much as possible like the other volumes, which were McDonald's own diary. Well, that required a tremendous amount of new research, even though I knew the subject reasonably well. And one of the things that turned up in a very out of the way place in the course of that research was an account of a conversation that Franklin Roosevelt had with a man named Arthur Sweetser, a League of Nations uh, bureaucrat and a friend of McDonald's in April 1938. Sweetser came to the White House and wanted to persuade Roosevelt to have a closer American relationship with the League of Nations. The United States had refused to join. That's what Sweetser wanted to talk about. Roosevelt wanted to talk about 
his recent initiatives on refugees. He had just had a cabinet meeting on the subject, and he had just called for an international conference on refugees. Sweetser wrote a blow-by-blow -blow account of this conversation, which went on quite a while. And Roosevelt said he wanted to get all the Jews out of Europe. Well, I had to spend a lot of time with Franklin Roosevelt, and I had never seen anything like that. So that was the moment when I said, now, when I'm done with this volume, I have to go and do something more on Franklin Roosevelt. I talked to a friend of mine in the publishing world, and I said, I want to do a book on Roosevelt before and during the Holocaust. And he said, don't do it. And I said, why? And he said, it's been done. And I said, not well enough. Uh, I might have used less tactful language. <laughs> and he said, doesn't matter. The publishers think it's been done. You're going to have a lot of trouble. And then he said, you need to do something different. You need to do Franklin Roosevelt from birth to death, his relationship with American Jews, as well as his dealing with the issue of European Jews before and during the Holocaust. And I said, oi, <laughs> that's 10 years work. And then I thought about it and remembered that another colleague of mine, uh, one of the very best American political historians, Alan Lickman, uh, had just finished a project. And I said, maybe I can get Alan to do this with me. So I went and pleaded with him. And he took some time to investigate the literature and came to the same conclusion that I had. And so it only took us five years. <laughs> Let me give you a quick overview of what we found. And then uh, let me talk about a couple of case studies, um, one of which uh, is from the earlier portion of the book, which the class hasn't read, uh, probably, uh, and one of which uh, is from the portion that the class uh, did read, but not everybody here has read the book. So these are the two case studies that most people think of when they have a quick uh, sense of what the United States did not do. The story of the SS St. Louis, the ship, and the complicated uh, tale of why the United States did not try to bomb the gas chambers and crematoria at Auschwitz-Birkenau. All right, first, an overview. We decided that one could envision four different periods in Franklin Roosevelt's presidency. Yes, he was a four-term president, but that uh, only coincided really with the first uh, phase of Roosevelt and the Jews. The new president, Franklin Roosevelt, did not deal much with uh, 
the problem of Nazi Germany or with the problem of German Jews. He was largely a bystander. He had other priorities. The country was still mired in the depression. There was a real question of whether democracy would survive. The politics of dealing with the misfortunes of German Jews was very complicated. Roosevelt was already being accused of running the Jew deal, the opponent's term for the New Deal. He brought into his administration more Jews than all previous presidents had combined. Some of his close advisors, uh, Franklin, uh, Felix Frankfurter uh, in particular, were considered to be fairly far left. Roosevelt did not want particularly to expose himself to additional uh, criticism. Privately, some things happened behind the scenes where uh, there was some effort to uh, manipulate uh, regulations to benefit uh, refugees from Germany. But when the State Department objected, Roosevelt kind of left that alone and refused to take a public stance. So the first Roosevelt was largely a bystander. In 1936, Roosevelt was reelected in a landslide. Of course, we know that that was only his second term. But when he was reelected, he undoubtedly thought this was his last term. That was the tradition, but now it's the Constitution. He had a ton of accomplishments in domestic policy, some of which Social Security still are around. In foreign policy, he had done very little. And he was hamstrung by Congress, which passed a series of neutrality laws designed to prevent him from being too uh, activist in foreign policy. The American military, which wasn't strong to start with in 1933, was uh, progressively weakened by budget cuts to the point where by 1940, uh, after World War II had begun, the American military was smaller than that of Belgium. Well, one thing that Roosevelt thought he could do was begin to show his displeasure with Nazi Germany. And one way of doing that was opening the doors wider to refugees from Germany, Jewish and non-Jewish. And that led to a signal to American consuls abroad that they should stop using a particular regulation called the Public Charge Clause uh, to bar most prospective immigrants from Germany. If you were likely to become a public charge, you were ineligible to enter the United States. But the consuls abroad had been interpreting likely to become a public charge as possibly become a public charge, which meant if you were not independently wealthy or you didn't have a wealthy relative who was here already willing to support you, you couldn't get in. Well, that changed almost immediately after the 1936 election. And so the level of immigration from Germany, particularly about 90% of the immigration from Germany was Jewish, that changed in 1937. And it went up higher in 1938. And then after the German 
annexation of Austria, Roosevelt said, according to diary accounts, at a cabinet meeting that the full quota was going to be used. Well, it happened that the quota from Germany was not huge, but it was substantial. It was more than 25,000. And if you added in the quota from Austria, which they did, then it was more than 27,000. Well, not a huge number, but a substantial number. And that quota was filled for most of 1938 and for all of 1939, which was a big change from the earlier years. Roosevelt also, as I said, uh, wanted other countries to take more Jews in. This was first uh, highlighted at an international conference held do we have Evian water here? No, I'm afraid not. We should have Evian water. The Evian Conference in France. Um, but one country after another basically said, uh, we can't take in more people. And some said, we don't want Jews in particular. Didn't work very well. It wasn't useless because it showed other countries that the United States wanted Jewish emigration from Europe. And some countries in particular responded to um, the United States initiative in order to earn goodwill. The better known one is uh, the case of the Dominican Republic, which unfortunately was more uh, bluster than it was uh, action. Uh, but the story that is not very well known is that of Bolivia, which benefited from a powerful German Jewish industrialist there. And Bolivia gave visas to at least 20,000 German and Polish Jews trying to get out of Europe. So this was the second phase of Roosevelt's policies. Uh, the story of the SS St. Louis comes into the second phase, but in a peculiar way. And so I'll uh, save that for a few minutes. The second phase didn't really last beyond the start of World War II. It took a little while before people realized the war was going to be a terrible struggle. Um, eventually, Roosevelt concluded that the United States was going to have to play a role, indirectly or directly, in the war to prevent Germany <coughs> taking over Europe. And that meant that Roosevelt decided he was going to run for an unprecedented third term. And it also meant particularly after the shockingly sudden German conquest uh, of much of Western Europe in the spring and summer of 1940. That meant a totally new security climate in the United States. People came to the conclusion the American ambassador to France said so openly that Germany defeated France so quickly because spies and saboteurs had hollowed out France from the inside. And everything was rotten, and the country just collapsed. I used to have difficulty 
convincing audiences that people could really be worried about security issues, and particularly security issues posed by immigrants. I don't have to struggle to convince people about that anymore. Of course, <coughs> anti-Semites were eager to cut off Jewish immigration. But not everybody who was opposed to immigration was an anti-Semite. Overwhelming majorities of the American public were opposed to immigration, even if the immigrants were allegedly victims of Nazi persecution. Franklin Roosevelt said at a press conference, remember he was running for president, that unfortunately there were some cases of the Nazis coercing Jews to serve as spies by virtue of threats against their relatives in Germany. He said it's a terrible thing, but it's one that we have to watch out for. So this was the third Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, people who read about this subject are familiar with uh, one man in particular, uh, Assistant Secretary of State named Breckinridge Long, who was an old crony of Roosevelt's, uh, more a political crony than a State Department official, but he also had State Department experience. And Breckinridge Long was really eager to cut back on immigration and did his damnedest. Uh, Roosevelt also had some other advisors who were less alarmist and tried to be more gener generous. And <laughs> they fought with Long and with other State Department people. Sumner Wells was among them. And Roosevelt was there to adjudicate disagreements. Well, Long side won more of the cases than the other side because Roosevelt was worried about security. He was running for re-election. And he knew that any case of espionage or any scandal involving immigration was going to hurt him politically. And even after he was re-elected, he was worried about the perception promoted by Charles Lindbergh, among others, that Jews were trying to drive the United States into participating in the war. So the third Roosevelt lasted, really lasted until the middle of the war. Uh, one begins to see changes in July of 1943. Of course, that meant that the third Roosevelt persisted through the early phase of the Holocaust. And then through a series of uh, pressures and influences that we tried to describe in the book, Roosevelt began to conclude that maybe there were some things that one could do now that the war was going well to save Jewish lives. And that led, after considerable battles between the Treasury Department and the State Department, that led in January 1944 to the establishment of a new government agency called the War Refugee Board and that is the fourth phase of Roosevelt's activity. Most scholars, whether they are favorable to Roosevelt or hostile to Roosevelt, will credit the War Refugee Board with 
helping to save about 200,000 people in the fast, last phase of the war. So the Four Roosevelts. We uh, toyed with the title, The Four Roosevelts. We decided, no, no, they'll think Teddy, Eleanor, Franklin, and who? Uh, but uh, four phases of Franklin Roosevelt and the Jews. All right. Um, we went back to original sources. We tried our damnedest to find everything that was relevant. Uh, let me give you some examples of how our evidence cast new light uh, on things that people thought they knew already. The story of the SS St. Louis. Some of you may have seen an old movie called Voyage of the Damned. Some of you have read works of fiction or uh, nonfiction, allegedly about it. Uh, what do we say about the St. Louis? The background is critical. On November 11th, 1938, Franklin Roosevelt met in the White House with a man named Fulgencio Batista. Is that name familiar to the younger generation? OK. Uh, not quite dictator of Cuba yet, but a military strongman. <coughs> Batista was visiting in order to improve his image and to try to get the United States to lower its tariff on Cuban sugar. Roosevelt being Roosevelt, we don't have a, an official document of that meeting. But we do have some sources. Immediately after meeting with the president, Batista decided to go to New York, where he gave a speech in which he announced that he was very pleased to be cooperating with President Roosevelt in his efforts to do something for the plight of refugees from Germany. And a columnist for the Washington Post wrote, Batista has unexpectedly decided to extend his visit to the United States in order to work out a plan for dealing with refugees. So from mid-November 1938, until May 1939, Cuban consuls in Europe began to sell tourist visas to Jews trying to get out. By this time, the immigration quota to the United States, where most of them wanted to go, <laughs> was used up. It was full. There was a waiting list. By January 1939, 300,000 people were on the waiting list. But if they could get out of Germany to someplace else, they kept their spot on the waiting list. They would be safe, not necessarily well off, but safe. And so from mid-November 1938 until May 1939, ship after ship left Germany with refugees, prospective immigrants to the United States, most of whom had tourist visas, which were not supposed to be for long-term stay. 
but the Cuban government had apparently decided to look the other way because it was a good business and it was earning American goodwill. By May 1939, approximately 5,000 German and Austrian Jewish refugees were on tourist visas in Cuba. Then came the St. Louis. St. Louis left Hamburg in May 1939 with uh, 900 plus Jewish refugees, only to learn en route that the Cuban government had changed its policy. The president of Cuba apparently was dissatisfied, either because of a political backlash or perhaps he wasn't getting his cut of the money. And so the ship was told that those who had immigration visas to Cuba could land, but those who had tourist visas could not. The ship went to Havana, 22 people, 28 people got in. 900 or so others were not allowed to land. The ship's captain didn't know what to do. Sailed around for a while. Left Cuba, sailed along the Florida coast. There was plenty of publicity. There were telegrams to the White House. The quota was filled. There was no such thing then as political asylum. Roosevelt had already stretched the quotas once after Kristallnacht, when he unilaterally announced that 10 to 15,000 uh, Jews on visitor's visas could stay in the United States indefinitely, and he got a lot of flack in Congress for it. In mid-1939, his highest priority was to get Congress to revise, to weaken or eliminate the neutrality laws that were going to prevent the United States from helping either side in the case of war. He didn't want to alienate Congress over the fate of 900 or so people. There were negotiations while the ship sailed around. The Coast Guard began to track the ship. Some of the passengers, some of the passengers, by the way, are still alive. They were children at the time. Uh, maintain to this day that the Coast Guard was trying to prevent them from landing in the United States. The Coast Guard didn't have to prevent them from landing. They had no visas. They could not enter the United States. We know the story, not of how the Coast Guard started to track the ship, but why it continued to track the ship. Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, Jr., who was Jewish, called the Coast Guard captain and said, I understand you're following the St. Louis. Yes. Please keep doing that, because we have negotiations underway. We don't know where to send the ship yet. Negotiations with Cuba, negotiations with other countries, but something's going to happen. Morgenthau's secretary was on the call and kept a transcript of the conversation. <laughs> it's available. And he concluded by saying, but don't tell anybody that I'm involved in this. So the negotiations in Cuba failed. The negotiations in Europe succeeded. 
Britain, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands agreed to divide the passengers. Those who were who landed in Britain were permanently saved. Those who landed on the continent had to deal with later developments, the German conquest of those countries. Even so, the Hollywood version of the story is misleading because we now know, thanks to uh, uh, two uh, diligent scholars based at the Holocaust Museum, that more than two-thirds of the passengers survived the war and the Holocaust, and about half ended up in the United States after the war. Tragically, close to a third of them died. But that's not the Hollywood version, where most of them died. June 1939 was before the war, was before the start of the Holocaust. It looked like a reasonable solution at the time, not a great humanitarian solution, but a reasonable compromise. Certainly, the passengers expressed their gratitude at the time. So that's the story that we found of the SS St. Louis. Uh, I'm going to go quicker through um, the story of the non-bombing of Auschwitz and Birkenau, because some of you have read about it. One has to understand the chronology and the limits of military action. It was not possible for American or British bombers to reach the extermination camps in the East until the Allies conquered enough of Italy so that they could fly from air bases there. Sure. That basically happened in the late spring of 1944. Extermination camps were in the East not in Germany proper. By the middle of 1944, the only one still operating was Auschwitz-Birkenau, which was the most lethal. And there were requests for the United States and for Britain to bomb the rail lines and the gas chambers and crematoria themselves. They came from well-connected individuals, some in Europe, a couple in the United States, but not from major American Jewish leaders or organizations. Why was that? Well, first of all, you had to know a lot about what was going on in Auschwitz-Birkenau, and you had to believe it. <coughs> Secondly, there were a lot of competing issues and priorities, and in retrospect, one can say that perhaps they should have focused more uh, on this one case. But very, very few of the potential activists knew that the United States was, in fact, bombing industrial targets very close to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And that's the information that kind of makes this, in retrospect, a missed opportunity. The proposals came to the War Refugee Board, which investigated them. They came to the conclusion rather quickly that it would not do much good to bomb the rail lines because the Germans were repairing rail damage within a day or within hours. And you weren't going to risk the lives of pilots uh, for something that was basically of little value. 
But that left the idea of bombing the gas chambers and crematoria. I'm not a military historian. I've been to conferences where they have talked about this issue. And it's basically, I'm not going to say it's a 50-50 split, but it's, it's pretty even between those who think that it could have been done and those who think, hey, precision bombing in World War II, you're out of your mind. In 1941, there was a study done, and the large majority of Allied bombs dropped did not get within five miles of the target. The gas chambers and crematoria had a narrow ear profile. So I'm not going to take a strong view on whether that could have been done. I do think we can say that if they had succeeded, it would have saved lives. It would have saved lives because of the horrendous efficiency of the process. But we certainly can also say that if they had succeeded, the Nazis would have turned to other methods of killing. They had shot hundreds of thousands of Jews before the first gas chamber started operating. And they did shoot and starve to death Jews in the last phase of the Holocaust. So we found no evidence that the proposal reached the desk of Franklin Roosevelt. A War Department Assistant Secretary named John J. McCloy shot it down very quickly and repeatedly in very uh, in his 19, in his 80s, McCloy suddenly remembered that Roosevelt hadn't been in favor of this, uh, but there's no documentary evidence whatsoever to support that account. He was by then trying to deflect criticism of his own role. It's possible because Roosevelt was Roosevelt. We don't think Roosevelt would have approved <laughs> such a mission because it wasn't his uh, habit to interfere with the military in its choice of targets. And he did generally agree with the strategy that the earlier the war came to a conclusion, the more lives would be saved. So that's our view. Um, I have gone a little longer than I wanted to go. And I know there are always questions. So uh, let me open the floor. Thank you so much for your talk, Professor Weidman. An obvious question, of course, is why does this continue to vex historians that this debate perhaps even began at a rather belated period of time, in the sense of quite a removal? Um, but further than that, that presupposes that it has the status of a debate, in the sense that there are two legitimate opposing sides that concede their differences based on not disagreement of the facts, but rather interpretation. So based on the, the very vexed nature, one could take the opposite uh, reading of the debate that, in fact, uh, there is not a concession that there are two equally valid sides. Well, there are two sides. Um, thank you for the comment and the question, because it uh, it reminds me of something else I should have told you. We wanted to um, look at Franklin Roosevelt in the context of his times. Because you, you can't understand his behavior if you're judging him by 21st century standards and 21st century knowledge. That's just, I mean, it's, it's like uh, you know, playing gotcha with somebody who lived a long time ago. Uh, and um, it, uh, it might lead some people to condemn him and 
uh, generate a great deal of moral outrage, but I don't know what good that will do today. It's not going to save the lives of people who died. Whereas if you look at the complexity of the situation that Roosevelt faced, maybe there is something we can learn. So that was the first thing we wanted to do, is judge him by the standards of his day. And that's why it is important that some people did, in fact, propose the bombing of the gas chambers and crematoria in 1944. And Roosevelt's legacy would be less contested if they tried to do it. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is it's a little trickier, and it can get us into sticky contemporary <laughs> analogies. But we also wanted to, OK, so we know more today. So let's use some of that knowledge. I mean, we know that they were bombing in the neighborhood of uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. But what else do we know? Well, there have been a number of cases of genocide since the Second World War. And what's happened? Not much in the way of outside intervention, certainly not very early. Uh, yeah, there's the exception of the third time of ethnic cleansing in the former Yugoslavia. Yes, President Clinton finally, the third time around, uh, intervened and made a difference. But apart from that, the record is pretty bleak. And what does that tell us? Well, it tells us something about the difficulty. This is not something unique to the character of Franklin Roosevelt. It's a structural problem in American and world politics. Uh, what else does it tell us? Well, maybe we should broaden the field a little bit. Uh, let's, let's look at President Obama. So we had Libya. There were, you know, all kinds of cries that uh, Gaddafi was killing thousands of people. Uh, the outside world had to do something. And after some delay, the United States, as part of a coalition, but as the dominant part, intervened and ousted Gaddafi. It doesn't look like a magic solution at this point. Then there's Syria. The United States didn't, hasn't, and probably won't intervene under President Obama. Well, with Libya, the president was criticized by the left and by the right for intervening. Now he's criticized by the left and the right for not intervening. This, doing this in real time is kind of complicated, isn't it? Now go back and look at, again at World War II. Nobody can dispute the fact that the United States intervened in World War II and gave priority to the war in Europe, even though it was Japan that actually attacked the United States first. And if the United States hadn't done that, the Nazi toll of Jews in Europe would have been far greater. So there isn't any question about which side the United States took in World War II and the fact that its involvement made a critical difference. 
it's quite true that the United States could have done more in the way of humanitarian action. And if the War Refugee Board had been established earlier, it would have saved more people. But if you look at the series of actions uh, since World War II, or inaction since World War II, it, it, it became very difficult for both of us, Ellen and me, to look at Roosevelt as a villain of the Holocaust. It just, it doesn't work in historical terms. So we tried to come out with something that was balanced, something that was nuanced. We are uh, moderately positive about two of the four Roosevelts and negative about uh, two of the four Roosevelts. Um, there's an article in the New York Times about a new book about Thomas Jefferson today by uh, two uh, scholars. Uh, Peter Onuf is one of them. He's the one I know. Uh, Annette uh, Gordon is, I think, the, the second one. It says, we're trying to describe him as neither a god nor a demon. Well, that's the way we try to describe Franklin Roosevelt. Could you assess briefly the influence of two uh, prominent Jews at the time, uh, Henry Morgenthau, who you alluded to, and Rabbi Stephen Wise on uh, the president? OK, the, the question was about assessing Morgenthau and Wise, Stephen Wise, Rabbi uh, Wise, the head of the American Jewish Congress. Um, Morgenthau was Secretary of the Treasury from 1934 on. He was a friend and neighbor of Roosevelt's. They had a close relationship, but uh, it was a relationship of unequals. Uh, Roosevelt sort of viewed himself as above everybody. And Morgenthau was certainly deferential. Uh, so uh, Morgenthau was kind of leery of being too Jewish. <laughs> he was not a Zionist, uh, although he was sympathetic to Jewish immigration to Palestine. Uh, and it took a lot before he was willing to become an activist. His staff played a critical role in bringing to him evidence of the State Department's misbehavior of trying to bury information about the Holocaust and uh, stall relief efforts. And once he got angry, uh, then he really played a critical role. And I don't think the War Refugee Board would have come about uh, without him. There's a alternative interpretation that Congress was going to do it, but I don't believe it. Uh, it's, it's very rare for Congress to take a powerful initiative in foreign policy. Uh, and at that time, Congress was badly divided. I, I'll, I'll leave off the analogies. Uh, so uh, that's Morgan, though. So I really do think he was quite important. Uh, Wise is also controversial because a lot of people thought that he got so close to Roosevelt uh, that he lost his objectivity. I don't really think that's true, although Wise is a, as a man and as a leader has his flaws. He was egotistical and uh, somewhat petty at times, and uh, he was into uh, not only gossip, but organizational infighting. And there were rivalries among Jewish organizations, and that didn't help. But I think you needed somebody who could actually get into the White House and talk to Roosevelt. If you were only dealing the outside, either uh, in the press or uh, there was a march of Orthodox rabbis uh, in Washington, D.C., you, you weren't going to get Franklin Roosevelt's ear. And 
Stephen Weiss was probably critical in uh, spiking a State Department uh, declaration opposing Zionism uh, in the late summer and fall of 1943, because uh, Roosevelt had written OK on it without paying much attention to it. And Wise got in and told him that this was horrendous and it was going to cause all kinds of problems. And so I think, you know, Wise did more good than harm. Did he do everything he could have done? No, he did not. But that's my best judgment. Thank you. How would you characterize the uh, State Department's role during this period? Well, generally speaking, uh, it was pretty bad. Uh, I don't think you ought to blame everything on Breckenridge Long because a lot of the career State Department bureaucrats were just about as bad. Uh, Sumner Wells was kind of the good guy, and there were a couple of other relatively good guys. But again, let's look at this in the context of the time. There were relatively few government officials who saw in the midst of World War II a big role for the United States in defending human rights throughout the world. And even among those who did, there were, there were a wide array of human rights abuses. Look at Stalin's uh, Soviet Union. And uh, you, know, you, you could pick and choose where you wanted to, to go with that. So um, in general, the State Department role was very negative, but it's, it wasn't the work of one critical bureaucrat. It was a state of mind in the agency. And some people have said, you know, the State Department today, it's different. The personnel is certainly different. But the state of mind, uh, not so different. Not 100% different, anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Knowing what we know now uh, and learning from the mistakes and successes of the Roosevelt administration, do you think that we should take in more refugees from Syria? <laughs> yes, if they're carefully screened. How much more? That, that was the, uh, one of the critical issues that came up in 1940 and 1941. The State Department decided that anybody who had close relatives in totalitarian countries Remember, for a while, Germany and the Soviet Union were allies. So that put them in the same category. And then there was Italy that was considered totalitarian. Anybody who had close relatives was a security threat. And you didn't admit people as immigrants or even as visitors unless there was no doubt. So that was a bad policy. But you know, is there a security issue today? Well, of course there's a security issue today. So you need to do careful screening. Yeah. I think you presented a story without heroes and villains, essentially, which sounds absolutely right. But the uh, pers persona of Rosa remains kind of a problem here. We began by saying that this is a man who said different things to different people. So my question is, did you get to know him better? Or is, it, is he still an opportunist and a politician? Well, he was above all a politician. Um, and you know, he was a master politician. So he understood his time. He understood the public. He understood Congress. Uh, and he believed that he was on the side of the angels. He saw the problem that Hitler posed early. He tried to do things about it, not immediately, but far more than the American public or Congress wanted to do. And he believed that that kind of justified whatever failings uh, he might have. We, of course, 
uh, think of him as a, you know, as a kind of superior person in terms of his ability to affect things. Uh, we don't often think of the fact that he had literally to struggle to get out of bed in the morning and that his energy flagged after a while and there were just only a certain number of things that he could choose personally to do. He wasn't going to purge the entire United States government in order to get rid of people who were uh, Republican isolationists. It just wasn't going to happen. He wasn't attentive to bureaucratic warfare, and he didn't have the energy for it. That would have been a marathon that would have consumed everything else. So he worked with the government that he had. He tried to get people that he could trust in key positions that sometimes worked, sometimes didn't work. So. Uh, Yes, he's, he's neither a hero nor a villain uh, on this range of things. And that is a problem with some of the literature, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, some of the earlier literature on uh, American policy during the Holocaust, and some of the biographers who are, uh, you know, Roosevelt never did anything wrong. And we were looking for something in between. Did you happen to find any documentation on Karski and his resident Yes. Uh, the, the question was about the Polish courier Jan Karski and documentation. So uh, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, Karski kept some notes at the time, which are in Polish and uh, available at the Hoover. Uh, I haven't used them, but another scholar has. Karski met with Roosevelt in late July of 1943. Uh, Roosevelt kept no records of that meeting. Karski later said different things at different times about that meeting. Uh, the, the version that I go with, because it fits other things that I know from other sources, is that Roosevelt, uh, Karski came out of occupied Europe, went to London, met with the British government as well as the Polish government in exile uh, in December of 1942. Met with Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden. Karski said, the minute he raised the question of Jews in Poland with Eden, Eden cut him off. He said, Roosevelt was interested in everything, including the question of Jews in Poland. But at the end, Roosevelt was noncommittal. He said, tell your people we will win the war. But a few days after that meeting, uh, Stephen Wise called Morgenthau, pushing a World Jewish Congress rescue uh, effort in Romania and in France, and they were trying to get some kind of resources in, even though it was illegal to uh, send money in to occupied territories. Well, they figured out a scheme of sending money into Switzerland to be accessed after the war so they could borrow money within Romania and France for relief. And Morgenthau and Roosevelt had a conversation, and Roosevelt said, in effect, this is OK. Well, I think there's a connection between the meeting with Karski and the meeting a few days later in which, for the first time, the American government encouraged that relief effort. So I think Karski did some good. You mentioned that Roosevelt had a very high opinion of himself. That high opinion was held by many in the Jewish American community in the, in the late 30s, especially through the war. 
Was he proud of that opinion? Did he feel he engineered that opinion? Uh, was he proud of his support from right. American Jews? Right. Well, any politician is proud of uh, his ability or her ability to uh, get uh, massive backing, but Roosevelt did not want to be seen as a Jewish president. Uh, that was not good politics. However, uh, you know, he was fairly close to some Jewish congressmen uh, who were effective in mobilizing support. He got roughly in his uh, uh, three, uh, the last three uh, elections, he got roughly 90% of the Jewish vote, which is an amazing amount. And the people who say, oh, Roosevelt, he was an anti-Semite, you know, you, all these people are uh, uh, just blind to his nastiness. Well, you're, you have to say that 90% of American Jews at the time were just completely wrong, and I'm not, I'm not willing to say that. Other questions?